All right, it's time to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event on how to manage crisis communication in a climate of chaos, part two. In part one, we dove into search and why controlling search results is a critical component of crisis management. Today, we'll be exploring modern crisis communication more broadly and touch on digital strategies, tactics, and best practices you can employ to mitigate a crisis or even benefit from one. As Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Hi, everyone. My name is Jesse Jacobs. I am the CTO of Lightbox Search, and I will be your host today. And man, am I excited because joining me are some of the leading experts in crisis communications and digital strategy today. Today's event is sponsored by Lightbox Search, a technology platform that empowers PR and communications professionals to monitor and defend search results locally and globally. New metrics and powerful reporting help prove ROI to clients and win new business. Our team will drop a link in the chat if you'd like to learn more about Lightbox, but we'll also stick around after uh, for a short demo if anyone would like to see that. With that, allow me to introduce our first guests. We have Frazier Engerman, Senior Director of External Relations at Walgreens, and Larry Moskowitz, the Lightbox Search CEO, who in their fireside chat now will discuss you know, how Walgreens tackled the COVID crisis. And with that, I'm going to excuse myself and let these gentlemen take over. Thank you, Jesse. And it's a pleasure to be here with Fraser. We've had a chance to have a couple of chats ahead of time. Um, and I was just mentioning uh, to him that the, uh, the typical crisis uh, preparation that I was engaged in over the years was with a major airline, and we were able to write a book with, unfortunately, you know, the kinds of uh, anticipated events that could be. And some of the unanticipated, as best as our imagines, could, imaginations could range. Uh, I work with a major oil company that uh, anticipated things that could go bad. A major auto company that things that could go bad. Um, and um, most of them had a kind of a slope. So they start they uh, reach an apex and then they begin to subside. Uh, in this instance, uh, as Fraser will both show and tell and discuss, uh, he hit a plateau with hills on it. Uh, and this has been going on for quite some time. So uh, with that, I'll turn over the, uh, the microphone to Fraser Engerman of Walgreens. Good afternoon, Larry. Thank you for having me and, and good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever time zone, good morning. Uh, great to be here with you. Yeah, as Larry mentioned, uh, this was unprecedented in Walgreens 100 year history. We had never faced a moment like this. And for most of us, it was a defining moment, not only in communications, but across the enterprise, whether you were in pharmacy, whether you were in retail, uh, with 9,000 stores across the US and Puerto Rico, uh, we're literally within five miles of 80% of the U.S. population. So we were on the front lines like many others. Um, but we had a little bit of an advance warning of what this might be coming to uh, because we have an interest in a Chinese uh, mainland China pharmacy business. So early on, we, we saw the writing on the wall, if you will. But certainly, we were never prepared for what was to be the tsunami, if you will, that was coming across the ocean literally and figuratively with COVID. So early on, we, um, we had to really pivot pretty quickly. And the key for us was for communications was having a seat at the table with the business operations folks. Because quickly we had to mobilize an entire company. Uh, really, this was like D-Day uh, for our company. And to give you an idea of what we went through and how we responded, um, I'm wondering if we can play the, uh, the video that we have here today. This will give everybody a little bit of a sense of what we were dealing with over the last two years and some of the highlights of how we responded and how we came together as a company uh, to help our patients and our customers. The coronavirus forcing millions more Americans into virtual lockdown. Coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. The coronavirus death toll in the United States is now more than 212,000 people in this country. And that's what's causing them to be resistant to getting the vaccine. When COVID-19 gave the world its biggest health crisis in a generation, it also gave Walgreens its biggest challenge in a century. Cut through the misinformation 
disinformation, hesitancy, and rampant healthcare inequity to get as many people vaccinated as possible, fast. In short, this was our shot. This is our shot at returning to the faces and places we love and miss. The COVID-19 vaccines are ready, and so is Walgreens. So when you're ready, they'll be ready to give it to you safely for free. The one thing I'll say, the most common side effect that I've seen right after getting the shot, yeah, tears of joy. Earlier this morning, we saw that very first patient getting a vaccine at a Walgreens. Walgreens called on some friends and partnered with expert pharmacists, public health officials, influencers, and trusted celebrities to provide real answers to community's biggest questions. If the medicine's available, we need to take it. But some communities needed more than answers. They needed access. And Walgreens was there to provide it, partnering with churches and universities to open more than 1,300 mobile vaccine equity clinics and administering over 200,000 vaccine doses, spanning 18 cities in 60 days. They also joined forces with Uber. Walgreens and Uber are teaming up to give people in underserved communities free rides to vaccine appointments. I like this. 10 million. That's how many free rides we're talking about. Literally delivering shots to where they were most needed and teamed up with other companies to help educate. Answers, access, understanding. That's how Walgreens and their partners answered this challenge. They gave and continue to give every American their best shot at getting back to who and what they love most. So Larry, that's uh, <clears throat> a little bit of a sense of what we have done over the last two years. And proud to say that communications was right at the tip of the spear, if you will, as we went through this as a company. Yes, I can only imagine. And I would also imagine there was no possible way you could have been totally prepared uh, down to the T uh, for what everyone and uh, all the elements that should be working together to uh, to confront this. It right. was all improv. You had improv at all. Yeah, and, and really the narrative took a lot of twists and turns, right? Because we were dealing with labor shortages, keeping our employees and our team members safe. And then we were dealing with this patchwork of guidelines all the way from the federal government to the states and local, whether it was mass guidance, inconsistencies in policies among the states, uh, vaccine equity or vaccine supply shortages. We also, quite frankly, had problems with our technology on occasion with our scheduler, which was causing all kinds of confusion. Um, so we had a myriad of mini crises, if you will, that were all kind of hitting at the same time in a very compressed time frame. And we talked earlier, and I think it would be interesting to share with uh, our audience, um, what you felt you and your team had done best uh, and what you wish you had, had done better. And you brought up a really interesting done better example, which was new to, I, I hadn't thought yeah. of it and it's, it made absolute perfect sense. So what was the thing you, that you're most proud of that you did do right? Yeah, I think there were a couple things actually. I think we, once we got our war footing, if you will, uh, we were very prepared. We had a plan, we brought in additional backup. We had a very triaged approach to issues that came to us. Uh, we made sure that we were crafting and finally honing our messaging, which was constantly changing, if you will, because of the constant shifting of the uh, of the issues. And we were continuously doing monitoring, both social as well as data. Um, so we were utilizing all of our resources. And I think those that those combinations, uh, I think, are probably what we did best in dealing with this ongoing crisis. And one, one main thing I do want to say is, you know, we, we stopped asking for permission. Uh, Walgreens, historically a pretty conservative com company. And, uh, um, you know, we were, we were out there putting our senior most people on GMA, the Today Show, doing interviews with the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, where prior to the pandemic, we probably wouldn't have been that out 
in front of issues. We would have preferred to be in the background in many cases, let others do the talking. But as a communications team, we realized that we were a harbinger of information and a sea of disinformation. So we, we really stopped asking for permission and we just went ahead and did it. And thankfully our leadership was behind us all the way. Uh, they gave us that support and that permission and that trust to take a risk, to go out there and be proactive when we needed to be, uh, when we wanted to get our message uh, across a, a broader spectrum. And how about that, um, that lesson you learned that you wish you had done <clears throat> Uh, and the reasons why. Yeah, I, I think what we learned is that we probably could have done a better job making sure our own people were being taken care of. Don't forget, we were all working remotely. Uh, we were working tremendously long hours. Um, we were very concerned about burning our own people out. <clears throat> and I think we did a pretty good job of keeping track and making sure people the people were healthy and they were safe. <clears throat> excuse me, and they were, they were doing okay. But because we were in a remote environment, because we were all working crazy hours, I think we could have done a better job of rot rotating the team and bringing in additional resources to give our folks a break. And in terms of uh, how you, you perceived media, you had mentioned to me the first thing you do when you wake up is Google the company. Uh, so clearly search, is, which is what our business is and what we're kind of the last session was solely focused on. Now we're broadening the lens a bit. Uh, but search uh, in our perspective has now become the most uh, certainly Google is now by according to Pew, the most trusted source of news and information above all New right. York Times, Wall Street Journal, Fox, whatever. Um, so we used to talk, I remember five or six years ago, the buzzword was payos, paid, earned, uh, shared, and owned. And now it's spayos, search, paid, earned, uh, shared, and owned. And uh, did you have your ad team in, in terms of working hand in glove with you? And did you have your search and social people working hand in glove? Yeah, we were we were pulling from various parts of the company because we're a we're a small team and we we couldn't do it all ourselves. And there was just so much incoming coming at our team, just the day-to-day -day responding to media that was calling about the scheduler going down, or they saw this on social media. So we were we were doing our best to follow everything that was going on, but you can imagine it was almost nearly impossible. Um, so we did we did work closely with our social listening team. Our customer care team was very important because oftentimes media was calling us about a very specific issue with a customer um, that we would have to you know, stop everything that we were doing and really dig down deep to figure out what happened in this one instance. So we relied heavily on our customer relations team. <clears throat> Once we became aware of an issue that was popping up on social media, we would turn it over to them uh, because they had the ability and the wherewithal to work with our folks in the stores and in the field to figure out, okay, what happened here at this store? Why were people given the wrong vaccine? Or, you know, why was this individual turned away when they should have been? Um, because we we definitely made mistakes along the way. You you couldn't help but not make mistakes uh, with that kind of volume that we were doing. So we did employ uh, as many social media listening tools as we had available, uh, but it was not nearly enough. Uh, given everything that was going on. And then one last one before we yeah. turn it over to the whole panel. Um, in terms of uh, the medium that you think affected uh, Walgreen the most, was it television? Was it social? Was it search? What, what do you think had the greatest impact or was it the whole panoply of channels <clears throat> yeah, that's a that's a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know if there was one channel. Um, I think I alluded to before that we suddenly had uh, a permission to go ahead and reach out and take chances and put our people out, whether it was in print or broadcast. Uh, we even did some LinkedIn Live events that we, again, we wouldn't have done 24 months ago or wouldn't have thought about doing. So I think it was a combination of everything. Um, there was not one channel that we relied on, but clearly I think we, 
we went far and above where we had been before the pandemic, particularly with broadcast, particularly with national broadcast. You know, we, we had our chief medical officer who was very well versed and, and really good in, at doing uh, live television. And suddenly he became a very sought after guest for the morning shows uh, when we were, again, trying to get through the clutter of misinformation that was coming from all different sides. So I'd say for me, I think it was the broadcast medium that, that really uh, was a new territory for us in terms of really hitting it hard during the pandemic. Great. Okay, well, I see from the clock on my computer that it's 1.16. Um, uh, during our discussion, we may discuss the fact that you didn't have a chance to rest much before people went and found empty shelves uh, uh, for baby formula and new variants coming out and boosters right. and then uh, the additional boosters. So it kind of keeps on rolling, which brings my example of the plateau as opposed to a single uh, apex of a, of a, a mountain uh, that you've got a bunch of mountains <laughs> on top of that plateau. Uh, so We're never still climbing ended. It, by the way. I'm sorry? We're still climbing those mountains, by the way. Yeah, I'm Maybe sure. There's a Sure you All are. Right. Gentlemen. So I'll turn it back over to Jesse. Yeah. Fantastic conversation, guys. I think this is a great way to kick off the next part of today's uh, discussion. So if our other panelists could please turn on their cameras, unmute themselves, and join us. Um, we'd love to see you all. Hi, everybody. Um, so what I think we could do just to kick off is to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to go around and I'll just call on people as I see them on my screen. Uh, you know, you're all my favorites. Uh, so if we could start out with uh, Dave, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Fleet. Um, first off, thanks to uh, to Jesse and Larry and, uh, and Faye for inviting me back for this, uh, this second discussion. Uh, my, I, uh, my day job is overseeing Edelman's global digital crisis team. So I oversee our team that operating across Edelman's 60 plus offices around the world. Uh, I've spent about 20 years sitting at the intersection of digital and communications uh, and with a little over a decade of that being uh, within Edelman's borders. Awesome, thank you. Jessica, hi. Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm Finn Partners, Head of Global Public Affairs, uh, which is our work at the intersection of policy, regulation, and business, which is I think in some ways, the definition of crisis communications. I also uh, am a professor at the George Washington University where I teach at the School of Media and Public Affairs. Thank you, thank you. Larry Weber, would you say hello? Hi everybody, uh, Larry Weber. I've been in PR and digital marketing for over 40 years. Um, I'm chairman and CEO of Race Point Global and also was the founder and, of uh, Weber Shandwick, one of the largest uh, communications firms in the world. And I've written six books on uh, reputation and marketing, and I've seen a good, good share of crisis uh, along the way. So I'm happy to be here again. And it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us. And Michael, last but not least. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to Jesse and Faye and everyone for having me today. Very excited for the discussion. I'm uh, the Chief Digital and Social Officer at Hunter, uh, where my remit is largely operationalizing our approach to brand social and working very closely in concert with our earned and media relations specialists, as well as the brand storytellers on the owned and paid side of things to ensure that those things work in hand, hand in hand um, to both tell the sunny always on stories as well as be optimized in these times of defense. So uh, very excited to be here. Um, and I've also been a Hunter for about 14 years starting my career in earned media and shifting to owned and paid. So a nice sort of interesting uh, perspective of the way stories used to sort of begin to the way they now start from everywhere. Great. great. Well, it's great to have you all here. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. So what we're going to do is start off, I think, with just a, a nice opener question. You know, I heard a lot of great examples um, in the fireside chat, how digital has changed the way we respond to a crisis, you know, how the crisis communications landscape has changed as a result to digital media and digital content. Um, you know, I've never would have imagined having to, you know, have stores work together with social media analytics platforms and in, in real time and that sort of thing. So to the, uh, to the entire room here, how has digital, in your opinion, you know, impacted 
the communications and crisis communications landscape. Dave, do you want to start this one off? Sure. I mean, this is a big question, uh, and it's a it's a complicated answer. I think um, I think you can simplify it somewhat by kind of looking at the macro landscape and then at the kind of the day to day of how crisis works. Um, if you look at the macro landscape, I don't think crisis communications has ever been as complex as it is right now. Um, you know, we're coming out of two years of constant crisis, but we're emerging into a landscape that is pretty fundamentally transformed from where it was two, five, ten years ago. Um, you know, you're seeing new dynamics emerge around crisis itself, and a lot of them are underpinned by digital. They may not be overtly digital, but they're underpinned by it, right? So you're seeing, you know, um, the expectation of, of businesses to operate in the societal issues space that's manifesting in activism from inside and outside companies. Um, you're looking at issues that are becoming systemic and they're rippling across ecosystems. Um, and, and so, you know, whether that's, you know, threat actors in the cyberspace uh, targeting supply chains to try and, uh, you know, to try and create vulnerabilities elsewhere. If it's, um, you know, we saw uh, last year, I think it was, that in the, in the UK, the Premier League, um, we had a splinter faction within the Premier League of football that, you know, split off and all of a sudden you've got regulators and legislators talking about uh, le legislating and regulating clubs that were, weren't nothing to do with that issue. Um, you've got crises becoming more directional and weaponized. Um, so crisis used to be something that would happen to you. Now you've got actors that are creating crises and aiming them at you. Um, and you've got these mega crises like the pandemic, which just never seem to stop, right? That starts as a healthcare crisis and it is a healthcare crisis now, um, but it's morphed and evolved so much into so many things. And um, to your point earlier, Larry, it's, you know, it feels like it's just this plateau with additional inflection points. Um, but, you know, that's still playing out in like macroeconomics now or in supply chain issues now, the impacts of that are gonna keep rippling. So that's kind of the macro picture, which is complex enough. And then you've got the day-to-day -day of this. Um, and I think what's really important here is you've got to move beyond digital as just a set of channels when you're talking about digital in a crisis context. Um, so you've got new types of crisis. So things that are playing out primarily in digital or that are playing out in a new way in digital. I touched on activism earlier. You've got these kind of gotcha moments in social. You've got misinformation and disinformation, which is a really top of mind issue at the moment. You've got new dynamics that digital is generating. So like the speed of crisis is accelerated, like the level of uncertainty, the level of fragmentation of information consumption, the absolute panic that you often see within senior ranks when there's yeah. you know, a big spike in digital discussion. So there's these new dy dynamics. And then you've got the tools and techniques that you can use. Uh, so I'm seeing so, Michael so nod along a lot to this. What are your thoughts on all oh, this? How do you make listen. sense? Oh, that's, that's your listening voice? Listening voice. Um, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously everything, everything that Dave was saying, uh, my listening voice was very authentic in that case. But I think the other, th other thing I would add to that is, you know, you were talking about disinformation, misinformation. We also saw that in the Walgreens example very clearly. I think we have to be also realistic with ourselves that not only are we the ones responsible for putting correct information out there and education leading to advocacy, all those things, but we also have to sift through the disinformation when it comes to telling those brand stories that I mentioned on those very consumer facing channels like Twitter, what's a bot, what's a real person, what's the truth, you know, we have to use tech to Dave's point to help us to sift through some of that. Because listening is how we discern whether something is concerning to start with on social, right? And we have to know if the originator of that information is a real human being. Certainly if they are, we care about it and we want to double click on that. But we also are challenged by the disinformation that's even coming at us. So it's not just about us correcting the freeway, if you will, of the information, but also finding it ourselves and trying to make sure that we are identifying a real crisis so that we're not creating a story that's negative when it doesn't even exist. That's just a, another point to make. Jessica, we spoke a lot about storytelling in our preparation for this. And I see you nodding your head along to kind of that element of the conversation as well. With all this disinformation and increasing complexity in managing a crisis, how can you like tell your story the right way and actually have it be heard by the audiences you're trying to reach? Well, it's such a good question. And I, I think I want to pull on a few of the threads that yeah, uh, please. Michael brought up as well. No, we, you know, it's it, it is such a challenging and dynamic ecosystem when you're in a crisis. I sometimes think of it as, uh, it, you know, at the Museum of Natural History, when you see 
the map of the prehistoric ocean and there's the giant fish with the outsized teeth and there's sort of threats all around. But, you know, it, the, the digital piece of this is really a double-edged sword because it has the power to create, it has the power to quell, it has the power to pre propel, it has the, the power to kill. So I think, um, you know, my thought on the storytelling is I think a lot about sort of that storefront window and digital gives you an entirely new set of tools to add to the toolbox um, to help create your storefront window. And what search then does is allows you to evaluate how well did folks look at your storefront window and did they go in and, and you know, engage with your, your product. But, um, you know, it's, it's really easy to, um, adopt a bunker mentality in a time of crisis. And our clients often come to us sort of late in the arc of a crisis that happens. But I think remembering that crisis communications is really this strategy and, and operations of communicating with your key audiences. And Fraser mentioned it so well in his opening, which is to, you know, one of your key audiences in this time is your employees, your internal audiences. So always remembering that it's a test of your leadership and accountability. So thinking through, you know, the tremendous power of communications and how can you, you know, really um, tell those stories, stories in a moral and responsible way. Awesome. Before, thank you for that. And before we move on to another question, Larry Weber, I just wanted to give you the chance to, you know, chime in. You know, you've uh, clearly had a long career, you know, having founded Weber Shandwick, started a new company, Race Point Global, written many books. How have you seen this change occur, you know, over? Yeah, you know, one of the biggest changes I've seen is how we've moved to almost a completely visual communications platform. So it's, uh, and it's something that you have to be prepared for. Uh, we talked the last time about search and, you know, being, how do you manage that? But the idea that, you consistently putting out content, creating, you know, um, you know, the, the narrative and the feel of the company that in a positive way that the, the company's viewed as part of a society, as someone that understands computing and humanity. So that, for example, our, we have a large client, John Deere, we work hard to have regular videos on LinkedIn that explain their purpose and their reason for being, they're giving back to community, what they do for farmers, so that when a crisis does occur, your constituencies are comfortable in the way you communicate. And you have to immediately be able to do that in a visual way, because that's the way it's gone now. And nobody really wants to read whether we like it or not. So that's one thing I would say. The second thing I would say is social issues have become front and center for corporations, which they weren't that much for 30 or 40 years before. And companies have to have a position on certain social issues and be ready for that. And that's a hard one because your employees are not right, they're not left, maybe some of them are, some of them are, and you have to understand and be sensitive to that audience, but you still have to stand for something. So, uh, those are just a couple of the things that come to mind right away. That's some great points. Uh, and it kind of brings us to some of our next questions. We also have a question from uh, one of our audience members, which we'll get to in just a second, um, because it is related to you know, kind of what I'm about to ask now, is you mentioned uh, preparedness. You know, um, we all know once a crisis strikes, it's kind of too late. You have to be ahead of the game. So when you're not in a crisis, you know, how do you prepare? How do you use that peacetime to your advantage in terms of gathering the right resources, the right technologies, the right skills? What are those assets that you need to be able to pull on and deploy in order to you know, respond to a crisis and tackle it? Does anyone want to jump in first? I'm happy to, but I saw Jessica just Oh, sure. Jessica. Well, go ahead, Dave. I'll, I'll go after you. No, I, it's okay. I, I went first last time, please. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it is, it's always good to remind yourself that um, the, the planning, the assessment needs to be refreshed. And that, um, so, so I think that um, putting that 
into sort of a calendar of how do we maintain a state of readiness? How do we maintain you know, a, a current assessment of the organization? I think one of the things that's really helpful um, in a lot of our work is really just having you know, a simple flagging system. Right, so when when things happen, is this really a crisis? You know, is a negative tweet a crisis? No, but you know, what are the things that really can disrupt your business over time? And I think one of the things that really helps, like anything, is practice, practice, practice. Right, so training and ensuring that you know senior folks who are on the crisis team or you know the the members of your crisis team feel as if they have the tools and the resources in place to respond should they need to. And so no one is scrambling when there's an incident because there will be. I don't, you know, whether it's a cyber security breach or ransomware or, you know, something, you know, a physical, a physical crisis or financial crisis, there will be something. And so thinking through that and being prepared for those eventualities and exigencies is, is critical. So I, I want to, Dave, do you want to take that or? Sure. I mean, the um, I'll just layer, I agree with everything Jessica just said. And I do think it's important, like so many organizations under service, the prep, the preparedness side of things, right? No, like no one wants to invest in crisis preparedness until they've been in a crisis. And then all of a sudden it's really important and all of a sudden it's too late. Um, so, you know, the organizations that do best in the, you know, response and even recovery phases of a crisis tend to be the ones that have done that upfront work first, so they're not playing catch up. Um, I, I'd kind of bucket your preparedness opportunities almost into three. So there's that kind of upfront threat identification and monitoring. So, you know, what are you doing to identify your vulnerabilities? Do you have listening set up? Is your listening focused on your brand or is it focused on reputational vulnerabilities? Um, you know, are you benchmarking data in advance? Like, have you looked at your search results and whether they present vulnerabilities? Um, you're welcome, Jesse. Um, you know, are you reviewing your advertising campaigns for risk as you're building? Um, and then you've got like, so that's part one, threat identification. Part two, response protocols. So what do you do when, like when things are gonna happen, which they will to Je uh, Jessica's point. So you know, do you have clear decision-making paths? Have you mapped your channels to audiences? How do you know what data signals are gonna be important to an exec in the middle of a crisis? Have that all planned out in advance. Make sure everyone knows their roles and responsibilities. Um, and, you know, make sure people know when to escalate. Again, to Jessica's point, a tweet may not be an issue. Maybe it is. Maybe it's maybe it's a tweet about an active shooter situation. Um, um, but you know, so okay, so when do you escalate? Uh, and then there's how do you prepare your channels and your messages and everything ahead of time, which is the the, the more tactical piece. So um, you know, thinking about your broad ecosystem, what's the role of each of your channels in a crisis? Um, how will you up, uh, handle updates? What channels are going to be used for what scenarios and what audiences? Importantly, so I think there's a lot you can do in that upfront that mitigates the pain of the actual situation itself. So I'm going to take over just for a second because we have a, a real question from Liz in the audience that I think is going to make everyone here do a little bit of work. Um, now that everyone here knows how to prepare for a crisis fully, Liz is asking how it, she says, I'm interested in how to best communicate after an active shooter incident. It's something that's becoming a necessary part of crisis plans. So as serious as an issue as it gets, um, any thoughts on how to best communicate after the, you know, incident? Jessica, I saw you on mute, so. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's, it's really important anytime there's violence, loss of life, injury, that the communication happen with um, empathy and honesty, right? It, it's, it's so difficult. Um, you know, there are so many there's so many uh, uh, stakeholders when these these situations happen. I also urge, you know, that, you know, for for situations like this, you don't want to get out ahead of law enforcement communications. That can be a real challenge. Um, be sure that you're communicating with the latest set of facts. If you don't have them, don't guess. Um, these are, are really difficult and fast moving situations. So, you know, honesty, accuracy, empathy are, are, are really watchwords for these situations. There's no good way to, to make these 
you know, to, to, to soften the blow when you've had these situations because they create so much uncertainty and so much fear. But um, one of the things I always caution against is making unforced errors, right? First do no harm when you're, when you're trying to communicate about these things. I would just like, I would layer onto that a little bit, sort of going back to what Dave mentioned in terms of those two, the, those three pillars, the second and third, the second, which was in my mind, a lot of process mitigation, who's doing what, whose role is what, and much better if you've, ha you've done that before, right? Versus trying to say, ah, we need to define roles. And then the third piece he was talking about is the actual story, right? Whatever the, the strategy is that it's your story to tell that you've cultivated during peacetime. And if you've done it tactically correctly, right? You've thought about, different influential voices and things to tell the story so that on places like search, it pops a lot higher, right? But I would, I, would, I would actually focus more on the second part of that in terms of Liz's question, which is from a process perspective, we often counsel clients, that it's more about being respectful of the moment in time that we are all experiencing as humans, which is that this is the news of the day. And there's not a real need to necessarily hear from every person, every brand and every organization. I think sometimes being quiet and, and recognizing that your role is to not really have a role is, is as important in terms of the story you're telling. Now, from a from a from a, a mitigation process, sort of the decision tree, right, of it all, the uh, the phone tree, having all those IAT organizational discussions in advance. When X happens, we will we'll pause communications and have these, these conversations about what our message is and, and who we're delivering it to. We will set different filters with the time that we think we need to pause before we have a conversation of any kind. I think as communicators, we default to communicating. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves that taking a second and listening and being respectful is more powerful. That's a, a great response. Um, Larry, did you wanna? Yeah. Weber? No, I was just gonna. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> which, which, which Larry? Weber. I saw him sit forward. Sorry, I missed you, Larry. Um, no, I was just gonna say um, it's interesting to me that you know which corporations, you know, prepare statements. Uh, most recently, a number of them did on the Russian-Ukraine war, but very few had a position on the recent shoot school shooting and. Uh, I think corporations have to start understanding that they're hugely relevant in discussing and uh, and, and being opinionated about uh, events that happen, uh, even if they're as horrendous as killing children. So uh, I think there needs to be a big step up uh, by CEOs and boards that understand uh, their responsibility in a society um, that it's not just the government and the, um, the police uh, that are uh, have powerful opinions. So. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, does anyone else want to chime in on that, Dave? Yeah, just to pick up on some of uh, some of the points that other speakers have made. I think um, there is this, like it's been well documented, and we. A lot of people will know that Edelman does a, a, an annual study around trust. We've done it for, for years. And one of the things that that's you know, continued to throw up over recent years is these rising expectations of organizations to actually step in and help to solve societal issues. Um, we've seen that coming up uh, you know, year over year, um, even to the point now where it's expected from a geopolitical standpoint. Um, the, what we've seen over the last little while is a couple of dynamics that have really created some tension that companies are wrestling with. Um, number one is a lot of organizations paid a lot of attention uh, to what happened in Florida um, with, um, with uh, Disney. Uh, and what happened there um, has spooked a lot of companies uh, in a big way um, from speaking out. Uh, and then the other is just a feeling of complete exhaustion. Um, that these issues feel like they're coming out of the woodwork every day. And a lot of them are causing chaos when they land and it's pulling people away from what they see as the core of their work. And so you're seeing this rising exhaustion amongst, amongst the C-suite as well. And so those pieces are creating this tension, right? With what society is expecting, what people expect companies to do and you know, stakeholder capitalism and, and this role in society. Uh, and I think it is really important for organizations to have a consistent, decision-making process around these issues that doesn't just let the tail wag the dog. That's not just, hey, everyone else is talking about it, so we should. Sometimes you shouldn't, 
Um, and sometimes you, know, you shouldn't because there's no connection to your organization. Sometimes there may not be, but it's really core to your purpose uh, of what you're trying to, what, who you want to be in the world. Sometimes your stakeholders are expecting you to speak. Sometimes you've got a track record on an issue. And we saw a lot of organizations misstepping uh, around Black Lives Matter by speaking out on diversity before they did their own due diligence of what they were, uh, what they'd done internally. So I think you've got to, you've got to have a, a way of approaching these, these moments um, that balances and, and kind of calibrates around, among, amongst these. And really importantly now, avoids being performative. That saying something for the sake of saying something and having no substance behind it is just a pathway to, to your own new issue that's actually aimed at your own organization. The uh, yeah. To get called out for it. The filter we always apply when counseling clients in this to that exact point is there's the statement. And if that's the end of the, of the, the thing, then you haven't finished the sentence because there's the so what, right? The, the action you're taking, the, you know, as, as a lot of our junior staff, I think so wisely put it when we were sort of just pulling everybody, what do you look for as consumers, right? We want more than just words. We want to know the thing you're doing, right? And so to Liz's point about it being more than just a process question, because she's obviously talking about an organization that has an, an actual experience with violence in the workplace. That's where I think it comes back to that question of, you know, yes, yeah, sometimes communicating or not communicating is the communication, right? The medium is the message. But when you can enter the conversation with value from place of understanding um, and a place of trying to uh, create some good and some and to, to relate with that, not just relevance, but that sense of community, then I think it's a different conversation. Obviously, with something this sensitive, there are so many questions to ask before you would ever recommend the next step, because I think we'd have to understand, well, what happened? Um, what's the what's this organization's current plan, the work they're doing when things like this aren't in the news that you can talk to? That gets back to the conversation about peacetime. If you're creating a CSR program, don't do it just because it seems like something you should do. Do it because it's integral to the brand's DNA. Create all that storytelling because it's the right thing to do for your audience. And then when unfortunately the, 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 the sun sets on sunny days and there's a defense to be had, you don't have to pull it out of thin air and posture, but you can say, actually, it's, it's critical to our brand DNA to stand for this. And so that's why now more than ever, we're doing why. And I think that's the helpful decision you can make about whether or not you have a a, a place in the conversation. Yeah, so yes. I, absolutely, I was about to call on you, Jessica. Um, I just wanna address Liz, uh, Liz's specification, um, you know, that her question is regarding uh, a location that has experienced uh, violence, you know, in the workplace or at their headquarters themselves, not necessarily how companies should respond to a societal issue. So I want Jessica, but I also definitely want to call on Frazier to come back in and join in this because he's got, you know, 9,000 retail locations um, and, and they're at the front of this. So Jessica, can well, you I'll defer to Fraser to respond on the uh, the specific question. Fraser, yeah, do you want to? Uh, uh, luckily, thankfully, since I've been at Walgreens, we've not had a mass shooting incident. But literally, we have something happening across the country in every city every day. I see the reports. Uh, unfortunately, our security operations center is pretty pretty busy place, uh, as you can imagine, with nine thousand stores. We have the run the gamut of, of all kinds of incidents in our store, uh, everything from violence against our customers to our team members. Um, so we, we have it every day. Um, I think the important thing for us is good and going back to, I think what Jessica said earlier is don't get ahead of the, don't get ahead of the police. Don't get ahead of speculation. You know, we, we try very hard to make sure that our store team members, the folks who are in the stores, understand what the media policy is, um, because we don't want to put them in a situation where they have a microphone thrust in their face and suddenly they're having to speculate on what's going on. Um, and we also work with those team members. If there has been a traumatic incident in the store, we have field specialists who come in and literally will spend time on the ground in those stores offering counseling mental health support, whatever kind of support they need after there's been a traumatic incident. Um, unfortunately, our store in Uvalde, to bring up a recent example, is just a few blocks from the school. And a couple of our employees in that store were relatives of some of the deceased. Uh, so you can imagine what was going through their mind. And we actually had volunteer team members from other stores across Texas who volunteered to come in and, and staff that store so those folks could get a break. 
Um, so it's really important beyond just the communications piece is to be there for your employees because they have witnessed and gone through something that you know most of us will never experience. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, did you want to follow up? Yeah. Um, thanks, Fraser. Um, and that is, it is, you know, it's very real when the, the stores are, you know, in these communities. And when that happened, you know, we have one of our team members who is based in Valde. And, you know, these, these are very real things. But I think what we're talking about is this, um, you know, we've, we've got this very delicate balance as communicators. We live in a I mean, I work around the world, but certainly, you know, in the U.S., we're very politically polarized. We have these, you know, sort of culture wars, and that bleeds into how the organizations that we work with and for communicate. And there are issues like gun violence and access to safe and legal abortion and support for all of our members of com our community, whether they're marginalized or not. That brings around some, I think, I always think about the ethical imperatives that we have because in the work that we do, we have the power to pick winners and losers. And the power of, of communications and public relations is immense, right? You know, we can go back and look in the past 30 years of history and see what we've all done as communicators. And, and did, we, did we choose to support, you know, the things that create a world that we wanna live in? And I think it's especially important in this world where we have a lot of disinformation, people have called it a post-ethical world, that you know, our, our guidance really has to be that we help our clients act morally and responsibly. Is it easy to make those decisions? Do they have to have an opinion on everything? I don't disagree with my colleagues that you can't have a position on everything and sometimes it, it, it doesn't feel authentic or right. But I do think that that our moral obligation is to help guide our clients to help create a world that is, it is more, more just, more fair, has more, more you know, access for everybody. And we, we do have the power to do it. And if we don't urge our clients in that direction, um, then I think we've missed a huge opportunity. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to kind of just pivot a little bit forward, um, you know, in terms of act some actual like maybe strategies or tactics, you know, getting uh, ahead of a story or responding to one uh, requires, as you know, we touched on earlier with Dave, you know, um, managing a really complex array of channels and audiences. Um, and, and it's hard to, I would say, juggle all of that with equal dedication. So how do you go about as, you know, crisis communications professionals uh, prioritizing, you know, your responses across, you know, maybe search for us or social or news or television, uh, which one's most important, you know, how do they all work together? Any hands, Jessica, I, Michael? I feel, I feel like maybe you were on the call that I had earlier this morning yeah. where we had uh, a robust discussion about whether we wanted to um, you know, share an opinion editorial or a byline or whether the most important thing was getting the BBC interview right or were we gonna you know, set up that Twitter chat today? And you know, so it is, it is challenging to prioritize. I think that you, know, you always have to look at you know, what is gonna be the most you know, sort of juice for the squeeze sometimes. You know, are you really going to intercept the audiences that you need to reach? Sometimes, you know, doing, you know, one particular tactic is only gonna, you know, reach a very, you know, very small segment of your audience. So thinking really about, you know, who do we need to reach today with what particular message? And sometimes these are, these are, you know, flavorful stews with lots of ingredients and it's, you know, I put too much tarragon in that today. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy to prioritize, especially um, with um, all of the, you know, we've, we've talked sort of thoroughly today about sort of the complexities of the environment. So yeah, daily challenge to prioritize. I would just add, you know, I often try and sort of reframe this discussion when we're like at the IET table, which getting back to the peacetime that we were talking about, it should really be the moment where that functionality of each, each sort of 
person or organization's role is sort of clearly is sort of clearly understood. What I mean by reframing is instead of it always being about obviously prioritization is important, even in the initial crafting of a storytelling, we talk about messaging hierarchy. If you've got one message to deliver, what is it versus three? I think the same can be true with the channel plan in terms of you know what are the most important. But what I would add to the conversation is in this idea of search versus social, instead of it being you know, or recognizing that budgets are finite, embrace the and as more of the how one begets the other, right? We talked to, we talked a lot about search is a tactic, social is a tactic, influencer is a tactic, earned is a tactic, but search is also a destination for all these tactics. And so I think if you can sort of reframe your thinking so that it's not so much either or, but rather how does an earned placement that's told when there's no crisis afoot, but that is hugely valuable, hits on all our key messaging, tells that brand DNA, that story, how do you make sure that that is the thing people find all the time? Great times, bad times, you know? And so ensuring little things like make, you know, the earn strategy, placing the right stories, but then getting it shared by the right folks, whether it be influencers, you know, amplification platforms that rank highly in search. Again, it's not always the or, it's thinking search is the end result if people are going there to find the answer to something like the way they go to search on Twitter. So let's have the solution served up based on the way all these other things work together. So to, to sort of serve that same purpose. That's awesome. Larry Weber, I see you sitting forward. Well, you know, we do deep audience analysis for non-crisis and we should do it for crisis as well. That's something that has to happen on a regular basis. Second is the longer I've been in this business, I'm more and more dubious of broadcast than I am of uh, channels that can get feedback uh, and immediate feedback. And also, how do you layer that with influencers that are on your side so that you've prepared and researched and, you know, or searched who the really influential uh, people are in those social platforms, in Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, I find as uh, still an old fashioned broadcast uh, kind of medium. I don't view it as a social medium. And uh, I, Instagram and others, the other smaller ones like that, I think that coupled with influencer identification, audience analysis, and proper visual storytelling is extremely important. Yeah, great, Dave. I mean, it's, it's annoying that I'm going to somewhat violently agree with what we've heard from a few people already. But like, I kind of challenge the premise of the question uh, because I don't think there is a like pick this or this answer. And it's one of calibration. And, it, that, and the key factor in that calibration is who you like, which audience are you talking to in any given point? Um, and look, most of the time we're going to have a, a diverse mix of audiences, right? Um, but like still the number of, you know, planned uh, responses that we'll see from from the clients that will come through and it'll be all about how do we manage the media um, and then we point out to them that they're a digital first business and most of their audiences uh, that they actually care about from a consumer standpoint might not be reading these mainstream uh, you know tier one outlets um, it's all about where where the people are and I don't think you can um, like apply a blanket rule to that um, more often than not search is going to be important um, certainly with external audiences, but then you go back to our, our active shooter conversation and employees are your number one audience. Um, so uh, I think you've got, to, you've got to start with the audience. Uh, and critically, I think the, the, the takeaway in there though is you can't just look at these things as channels, right? Like this is a strategy question. Um, this isn't just where do we put our statement? Do we tweet it or do we put it on Instagram? This is what's forming our strategy for this response in this scenario. Um, so I think that's a really important piece to take from it. So do everything, making it real easy for these crisis communities. Not necessarily. <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. That's true. We do have to know when to remain silent and where to yeah, stay out of the conversation as well. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? I think we're you know, coming towards the end to the end of our conversation today. Um, so, you know, I don't want to open the door to too many you know, large questions. Um, but I guess as a follow-up to this, you know, when you are performing crisis communications and you're looking to determine whether or not you've had an impact or you've been successful, you know, what KPIs do you look at? How do you benchmark progress? How do you prove to a client, 
you know, that you've either handled the crisis or, you know, that you've managed the situation. Any takers? I don't see anyone else coming off mute, so I'll take a run and then everyone can Please, disagree yeah. with me. Um, so I'm a big fan of measurement that gets beyond um, the micro KPIs that are way too prevalent in the digital space uh, a lot of the time um, and focus more on business impact um, because ultimately that's what crisis is about, right? It's, it's helping to maintain business longevity and helping organizations both mitigate impact of whatever the situation is and then bounce back from it. Um, so, you know, there are macro KPIs and things like share price, which is ultimately, uh, you know, a, an indicator of the market's view of a potential future returns. So like, how quickly is the share price bouncing back? Here in Edelman, of course, I can't get through a sentence without mentioning trust, but like trust for us is a future looking indicator. It's like reputation is what's happened. What have you done in the past? Trust is, do I trust you to do the right thing in the future? Um, so like, okay, so have you benchmarked your levels of trust uh, before and after? Um, uh, our metrics are important too, but they, they get down more to the kind of operational optimization level. Um, so I think, you know, part of the answer to the question is, you know, are you looking at how was our response or how did this tactic work? And they, and that again, getting back to planning it all out in advance so that you're prepared and, and you know, to, to mitigate is the sort of outputs versus outcomes that you're getting at these, this, the business impact. You know, from a consumer perspective, we'd be looking at those outputs, the sort of just signals of success, maybe on the social platforms to suggest whether or not we're heading in the right direction to maybe make the fine tuning to what, to what we're doing to then ultimately be measured as an, out, as an outcome later. I would also just add to the conversation, we also like to talk about where did, just, where did it become a thing <laughs> that was concerning? I know that sounds very simple, but you know what I mean? If, if you were going viral on Twitter for negative news, um, but then cut to a couple of weeks later, the story is positive and on Moss, then you're sort of you're literally stemming the negativity where it where it started, right? So for us, that's a good marker from a little more of a micro perspective, but of the ability to assuage the concerns or to shift the conversation where it might have gone awry. That's great, Jessica. Yeah, and I think I have a little bit of a lens in in a middle of a crisis, which is the while the world is watching, you know, what, where are you going to be not just at the, the day that the, the crisis ends at the end of the arc, but, you know, where are you six months from now or a couple of years from now? And the one that comes to mind and, you know, I don't know who's on the line today, but, you know, sort of the diesel gate crisis, right? How did that, you know, you can, you can have sort of your immediate communications response and the things that you did and the restitution and the buybacks and that kind of thing. But how, how did that affect ultimately the brand and people's desire to go back to that brand and purchase another vehicle? So some of these things have a very, very long tail, but I think we are, our clients are well served if we are thinking not only how we communicate with their audiences during this crisis, but what will we be prepared? What are we, what are we teeing up for the long term? Because that will go back to um, what Dave so articulately um, talked about, which is sort of the future of trust. So you got to manage your reputation in the now, but you have to manage your, your trust and your engagement with your audiences for the long term. And Jesse, I might add, beyond the usual KPIs for us, everything we did was tested against our North Star, which was are we doing everything we can to provide value and support to our customers and patients? And we try not to lose sight of that with all the noise and clutter that's been going on over the last two years. We try to remain true to that North Star. Some days it was harder than others, but that, that was our goal, ultimately. I love that, right? Like crisis is the time when you kind of, if you do it right, you should be bringing your values and your purpose right to the, to the center, right? If you do that right, you're gonna build you know, you're going to prove those values, you're going to build equity in that space, you do it wrong, and you're going to prove it to just be a bunch of words on a piece of paper. So I really like that phrase. Yeah, it's less about real measurement. And it's more about the feelings and putting that purpose and understanding of your audiences empathetically, it's going to be extremely important. I also think what Frazier did when they did some Monday morning quarterbacking of what we did right, what we did wrong, how can we do this better? Uh, goes a lot longer way than KPIs or any kind of specific measurement kind of thing. 
All right. And I think, thank you very much, everybody. On that note, it's two o'clock. I think that concludes, you know, the portion of today's you know, discussion. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists and our speakers who participated today. I had a really fantastic time and I learned a lot about crisis preparedness and response. Um, Lightbox search is going to, and our team is going to stay on for a little while. If anyone would like to learn anything about the platform or even see a demo in real time, we'd be happy to put one on. Uh, Faye, thank you so much for hosting today's awesome event. And thank you to Compro as well. And I think that's that's it, everybody. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks, Appreciate bro. it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir.